happy snow day, folks. Uh, today I'd like to review quickly what we talked about last week and then teach this week's lesson so that you will be on track for the year. You won't have to miss a week of work. I know you're happy, right? Uh, so last week we talked about how to figure out uh, which are the valence electrons and what valence electrons do. So remember to use your periodic table on the test. Very important. If you have an electron configuration like this one, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p1, uh, then you could use the periodic table to figure out which element you are dealing with. So you'd look, so 1s2 is hydrogen and helium, 2s2, lithium and beryllium, uh, 2p6, this whole group on this row, boron to neon, uh, then 3s2, sodium and magnesium, and then 3p1 is aluminum. So you know that this is the electron configuration for aluminum. Um, and if you want to know how many valence electrons aluminum has, you just look for the biggest number. You've got 1, 2, and 3. 3 is the biggest number. You've got 2 in the S shell, 1 in the P shell. Three total valence electrons in aluminum. Uh, since you know aluminum's a metal, you know that it wants to get rid of its valence electrons to have the octet just like the noble gas above it, in this case, neon. So when aluminum ionizes, forms an ion, a cation, because it's positive, because it's getting rid of those negative electrons, then it will form uh, the valence shell just like neon. So it'll lose these three. It'll lose its three shell electrons here. Great erasing. And then uh, it'll form aluminum three plus ion. Um, of course, if it if you had a nonmetal, it would want to gain enough electrons to have eight in its outer shell. Hydrogen being the exception, it always wants two in its outer shell because it can only have two in that kind of outer shell, the one S two. Um, so. Uh, Metals are going to form cations because they get rid of electrons to get an octet. Uh, Nonmetals will form anions, negatively charged ions, because they gain electrons, negative charges, to get an octet. Uh, remember that also the difference between ionic and covalent bonds. If you have uh, a metal and any number of nonmetals, ooh, chromatography. Uh, if you have metals and nonmetals, then you will have uh, what kind of compound? An ionic compound. Uh, and remember that no real chemical bond is formed in an ionic compound. It's just that metals lose electrons and form cations, nonmetals gain electrons and form anions. And then, since one is positively charged, one is negatively charged, the electrostatic attraction forms that bond between the metal and nonmetals. Uh, so you have uh, an ionic bond uh, in that case. Also think about covalent bonds. That's a real chemical bond where electrons are shared between nonmetals. Uh, nonmetals, of course, want to gain electrons to get the octet. So they are unwilling to give up electrons, so they have to share them. And the sharing of those electrons is what forms the covalent bond. A covalent bond is literally the sharing of electrons only between nonmetals. Um, so uh, also last week we talked about periodic properties, uh, ionization potential, which is the energy required to remove um, electrons. Uh, of course, nonmetals have a lot of energy required to remove electrons. They don't want to give any up. Uh, it's easy to remove electrons from uh, metals. Uh, then we talked about electronegativity, um, the desire for uh, gaining electrons. Of course, we know nonmetals have a huge desire to gain electrons, and metals don't want to gain. They actually want to lose electrons, so they're not electronegative. These guys are very electronegative. Uh, and then we talked about uh, atomic radius. So, of course, uh, as you go down the periodic table, you add shell upon shell upon shell, and the atomic radius increases. But remember the counterintuitive part, that as you go across the periodic table, you're adding not only electrons, which you'd think would make the atomic radius bigger, but you're also adding protons. So the protons uh, 
make the nucleus more and more and more positive as you go across. And that larger positive charge in the nucleus over here, as opposed to over here, say comparing uh, iodine to rubidium, uh, you would have a larger nucleus with a larger attraction for the electrons. So even though iodine has more electrons than rubidium, it also has a nucleus with a bigger charge. So it pulls those electrons just a little closer to the nucleus. So rubidium has a larger atomic radius than iodine, even though iodine has more electrons. So that's kind of strange. Um, so that's a quick review of last week. So this week, uh, let's see. Uh, review questions. So review question, we'll start on number nine. Uh, what is the fundamental difference between ionic and covalent? I just talked about that. Uh, covalent uh, compounds um, have uh, sharing of electrons, true chemical bonds, and of course there are uh, only nonmetals involved in covalent bonding. Um, they, then ionic compounds have um, a metal and some nonmetals. They actually lose or gain electrons, and then since they have positive and negatively charged ions, they are electrostatically attracted, not a true chemical bond, but that attraction is strong, not quite as strong as a covalent bond, but strong enough to act like a bond between them. Much stronger than a hydrogen bond, for example. Um, so, number 10, what gases are involved in Earth's three-tiered protection system against high energy light that comes from the sun. So we know that the sun bombards us with light that's beneficial to life and some light that would be uh, dangerous to us, things that cause sunburn, skin cancer, etc., uh, cell damage. Um, so we have three chemicals that you can read about more in your textbook that help us. Uh, nitrogen, which you know is a homonuclear diatomic, so the molecule N2. Oxygen, another homonuclear diatomic, O2 and then ozone, which is O3, and we'll look at that a little more. Those three um, protect us from light that comes from the sun. Um, because nitrogen, oxygen, and ozone have double or triple bonds in their molecules, um, it requires more energy to break a double or triple bond than it does a single bond. And so the high energy light that comes from the sun, when it strikes one of those molecules, uh, they have that much energy in the double and triple bonds in their molecules, so uh, that light can actually break the double or triple bond when it strikes the molecule, and it's the right amount of energy to absorb the dangerous uh, wavelengths of light from the sun. So that protects us uh, because when it breaks the bond of nitrogen, oxygen, or ozone, it uh, ab absorbs the energy from that light, so that light never makes it to Earth to hit us. Um, Oh, we're about to have an interruption from Joe. Hello, Mia. Yes, go over there. Uh, so, uh, that being said, ozone absorbs UV light, oxygen, and nitrogen help. And I'm going to just check out what test question is uh, going to talk about that. Let's see. Uh, nothing, nothing big and exciting. I think we just covered everything you need to know about that. Uh, practice problems. So this week you'll be drawing more Lewis structures. We kind of started with that last week. Um, so we'll start on practice problem hmm, seven. Draw the Lewis structure for CH4. Uh, CH4 is not a molecule that you guys are expected to know how to name, but it's methane. Uh, methane gas we've talked about several times, CH4. So when you're drawing a Lewis structure, the first thing you want to do is uh, draw Lewis dot structures for each atom involved. So carbon, you look at, I know, honey, you look at uh, the periodic table, you can see carbon has one, two, three, four valence electrons. So carbon, one, two, three, four valence electrons. Then you have four hydrogen atoms, and they each have one valence electron. So to save time, I'll just put them in like this. So you're going to get four hydrogens. And I instead of drawing them separately, I just kind of stuck them in there. Uh, you can see that there are four holes available for carbon. Hydrogen uh, will donate like a metal in this case. 
kind of, uh, and so they'll share these electrons. So hydrogen feels like it has two on each of its atoms. Carbon feels like it has eight when they all share like this. So when you draw the Lewis structure for methane, you're going to have this, like this. You can see from the periodic table that carbon is more electronegative than hydrogen because it's further on this side. So uh, carbon will hog the electrons a little bit, but since it's very symmetrical, this is a nonpolar molecule. Mount. You have an arc that you took off my Christmas tree. All right, so methane, uh, the Lewis structure would be this. Is that what it's going for? Yes. So you need to figure out the dots, and then you can replace dots with bonds. So each little line here is two electrons. So you have two, four, six, eight electrons are in the carbon, two electrons for each hydrogen, which is exactly what they all want. Uh, so that's good. I don't have any dry erase markers. I put them all in my classroom, and I'm not there, so we're going to have trouble with erasing today. Okay. Uh, next question is... Number eight. What is the Lewis structure for PCl3? All right. Well, what is PCl3? Well, P is phosphorus, C is chlorine. Uh, is it ionic or covalent? First thing you want to think about every time. Well, P is a nonmetal, chlorine is a nonmetal. So you've got two nonmetals, so that is covalent. Uh, so when you name a covalent, remember that you have to use those prefixes. So uh, PCl3 will be uh, phosphorus trichloride. And you don't have to say monophosphorus trichloride because mono is always implied uh, if it's the first word. So phosphorus trichloride. <coughs> so then we figure out how many valence electrons are in phosphorus, how many are in chlorine. So phosphorus here on the periodic table, you can count over one, two, three, four, five. Phosphorus has five valence electrons. Chlorine, of course, has seven valence electrons on each of those three chlorines. If we draw the dots, we've got phosphorus here, one, two, three, four, five. Remember, like people on a bus, they don't want to sit next to each other unless they have to, so we spread these three out, but then we're forced to put these two together. Okay, so chlorine has seven, that means it has one available space, chlorine. Okay, so I find it to be helpful to use colors when drawing the dot structures so you can kind of see whose electron is whose, or at least whose electron used to be whose, since they completely share without noticing which electron used to be mine and which used to be yours. They just share. But you can see that uh, the 7 in chlorine leaves this one hole that phosphorus fills in perfectly. Uh, these three unshared pairs on phosphorus, or the three unshared holes are filled in perfectly by chlorine. So phosphorus trichloride is a very easy molecule. Now you have to draw this uh, unshared pair on the phosphorus. Uh, and then you can just draw lines, um, so as long as I <coughs> box this in here, and then you have to put the unshared on the chlorines again, which is a lot of dots, but that's okay. Okay, so we've got phosphorus trichloride just like this, uh, and you'll learn kind of how they orient themselves in space and why this unshared pair is important, I think, next week. So, phosphorus trichloride, just like that. Make sure you've actually done these before you watch the solutions so that you can check your work, or at least give them all a good try, and then check your work with this. Um, next is Lewis structure for FNO. Okay, so a couple of complicated uh, things with a molecule like this. So you've got an atom of flor uh, fluoride, fluorine, an atom of nitrogen, an atom of oxygen, all bonded together. So first thing, ionic or covalent, biggest question to start with. Uh, fluorine is a nonmetal, oxygen is a nonmetal, nitrogen is a nonmetal. And um, 
So all nonmetals means it's covalent. They're going to share electrons. Um, then you have to figure out, well, what's the order? Dr. Weil is always going to put these in order. Um, so they're going to bond fluorine, nitrogen, oxygen with that nitrogen in the middle. Um, if you're not given that, and he will, it'll always be in the right order on the test, um, just so you don't have to worry about it. But um, once you draw the Lewis dot structure for each, you can figure it out on your own, usually following kind of a few guidelines, and with experience, it'll get easier. So if we draw fluorine here, we know it has seven uh, valence electrons, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, nitrogen has five. Make sure when you take this test, after you watch this video and study, make sure you have a periodic table. You cannot do this test without one. Uh, and oxygen, if you look, has six valence electrons. So one, two, three, four, five, six. And then kind of the best guideline I can give you to tell which one to put in the middle is put the one with the most available seats in the middle. So fluorine only has one available spot, nitrogen has three, oxygen has two available spots to fill its valence. So I would put nitrogen in the middle because it has the most available seats. Um, that's not going to work every single time on every complicated molecule in this world, but for you guys that's the best rule I've got for you and that'll work pretty much every time. Um, that's why carbon often ends up in the middle because it's got four seats available uh, making it super happy to bond with pretty much everything. Um, so, put nitrogen in the middle, and then we start filling in. So I'm going to redraw all of these, hopefully in the right color. Um, so we've got a nitrogen. Let's see, we've got one that can go in there. And then this one is going to pair up with this. And this one's going to pair up with this. And this one's going to pair up with this. So that's kind of how that's going to go. Uh, so everybody kind of gets a friend. Everybody feels like they have eight. So we'll put here nitrogen's unshared pair is going to stay like that, this pair, because it's already got two electrons in that seat. So then here, fluorine's just going to share this one right here. Put the S in, and then it's got its unshared. Then, oxygen is kind of the complicated place uh, because it has two seats and nitrogen now once it's sharing with the fluorine has two seats left. So what's going to happen is, let's see, so nitrogen, they're going to get kind of between them. One, two, three, four. Those four electrons that aren't sitting with anybody and form a double bond right there. And then oxygen will get its extra guys there. So then you really have to check, does each of these atoms feel like it has an octet? Okay, so fluorine, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, it's got its octet. Nitrogen, kind of our complicated case, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. If it shares both of oxygen's unpaired, then it has eight. And then oxygen, it had its one, two, three, four, these four, and now it's got its two unpaired plus nitrogen's two extra unpaired, so it feels like it has eight. Uh, when you draw the Lewis structure with the lines, for this then, let me get a whole new color if I can, then you would have your fluorine, your nitrogen in the middle, and then a double bond to your oxygen. And then oxygen's unshared, nitrogen's unshared, and all of fluorine's unshared. So then you think, remember a line is two electrons, so two, four, six, eight, eight for the oxygen, two, four, six, eight, eight for the nitrogen, two, four, six, eight, eight for the fluorine. So it's going to look like this. And I know that can be kind of a challenge. It takes a lot of practice, but make sure you do the extra practice problems so you get enough practice. And I'm going to stop this video so it's short enough for YouTube, and I'll start again later.